Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Before I introduce the topic of today's show and my special guest, I'd like to thank you for listening to my podcast. It is still ranking high on Apple Podcasts' top 250 charts in the spiritual category that's out of more than 25,000 spiritual podcasts out there. Wow. I'd like to give a special shout out to my friends not personal friends, but my listeners' friends, in Great Britain, where my Quantum Living podcast was recently ranked at, are you ready for this? Number 74 in the top 250 chart. I would also love to give a special shout out to my dear listeners in Sweden, South Africa, Turkey, New Zealand and Slovakia, whose rankings keep my show regularly in the top 250 charts on Apple Podcasts alone. Thank you all, I much appreciate it, and I'm thrilled that so many people in so many countries around the world listen to and enjoy my podcast. And if you do love it, please support it to keep it free and available on demand. There is a new support link in the sidebar on my podcast website, quantumpod.pro, that's a short link, or if you prefer quantumlivingpodcast.com, where together with your tip you can also leave me a message, if you wish. And yes, it can be a private message for my eyes only. (laughs) And finally, now that I've got your undivided attention, I mean, I can't leave this until the end of the podcast, can I? I'd like to invite you to visit my brand new, refreshed and revamped main Quantum Living website with some new exciting services and programs. You will find it at quantumliving.com.au or simply quantumliving.pro. That's another short and sweet and easy to remember link that will take you there. Okay, now back to the fascinating topic of today's episode. The subject of intelligent beings from other planets visiting and interacting with the Earth is not new and it has been growing in popularity in recent years. There is, however, a noticeable shift in the ET narrative, from recounting the records of the UFO sightings and contacts with strange beings, including abductions, to detailed, almost scientific information downloads about our galactic neighbors by those who are able to receive them. Chariots of the Gods, a seminal book in the UFO paradigm by Enric van Daniken, was my personal introduction to this topic many years ago, other than my own ET experience in my early childhood when I was taken on board an ET craft. This was just the beginning, and the story unfolds and continues. To bring this fascinating topic to you on my show, I have invited someone who is well known in the ET circles, there is a double meaning here, (laughs) and can shed some light on this intriguing phenomenon. My special guest today is Debbie Solaris. Debbie is a galactic historian, an ET contactee and mythologist. After a fateful ET contact experience some years ago, 
Debbie awakened to her true star lineage of an Arcturian starseed and a higher calling on her spiritual path. She is a certified Akashic Records reader and gifted intuitive, using information channeled from her Arcturian and Pleiadian guides to heal and assist others on their own spiritual journeys. Through her ancestral connection with the Akashic Records, Debbie has been receiving downloads of galactic historian information and universal spiritual knowledge ever since. She feels that it's a big part of her mission while here on Earth to help awaken others to their own true divine selves and cosmic origins. Debbie has been featured on many TV and radio shows, including Gaia and Block Talk Radio, as well as on many podcasts. And now, Debbie joins me from Colorado. Hello, Debbie. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here, and it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Well, to start this conversation, could you please share with us a little bit of your personal journey that has led you onto this path? Um, I'll keep it brief, but because it is a, quite the long journey, as as many journeys are want to be. But uh, but pretty much, uh, I I, can, I consider myself a relative newcomer to the metaphysical and UF, UFO, you know, ET community. Um, I was pretty unawakened for most of my adult life, uh, at least my my since my early childhood and through I would say uh, my in, until my fifth uh, until I turned fifty. So before that, I was just living an ordinary life. I, you know, uh, went to school. Um, uh, I was I came from a military family, so we traveled quite a lot. You know, I um, spent time in Australia, so I was. Uh, we actually had a, an assignment in in Sydney, Australia, for a couple of years. So, I'm I'm familiar with Australia, and okay. I love Australia. So, um, I'm excited to be on an Australian podcast. Uh, but anyway, getting back to my story, um, I basically had this really basic upbringing. I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, never spoke about anything that was considered metaphysical or spiritual beyond the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so I eventually, um, uh, you know, I was, I was active duty Navy. So I spent six years in the U.S. Navy, um, traveled a bit for that. And then I worked in the environmental health field for quite a few years and uh, didn't have any any connections with ETs, UFOs, anything like that. You know, I was pretty, pretty basic. Okay, so ordinary. So um, my now husband, when we were dating, uh, he used to really uh, follow the paranormal phenomena and, and UFOs. And he would read quite a bit about UFOs in magazines and things like that. And that was my first introduction to the ET phenomena, you know, so and I didn't be- I didn't believe any of it. I thought it was a bunch of hokey. OK, I just was not. I was not <laughs> on board with it. I th- I thought there was a, you know, some sort of reasonable explanation for all of these crafts that people are supposedly seeing, and never imagined in a million years <laughs> that this would become my life's, you know, my life work, you know. So out of curiosity, um, I would read some of the articles that you know my partner read, but uh, again, was very skeptical. You know, didn't really buy into any of it. Until I had my own experience in um, 2012, everything changed for me. So I went from basically uh, a non-believer to being totally awake in just after one night. Um, So just like you, you had an extraterrestrial contact experience when you were you know, very young. I had it, my first one. And when I, when I, uh, I think it was like a month or, or a month and a half before I turned 50. So I was 49 years old. Um, and during this time, this was, this was in May, 2012. I was, I was very concerned about the state of the planet. So I always joke that I'm a spiritual wor- warrior, not warrior, not a warrior. <laughs> so, so I joke that I just would worry a lot about a lot of things. And 
Uh, one night I stayed up all night sending out this uh, really earnest prayer to the universe asking for divine assistance for planet Earth because we needed help. We needed help on all levels, you know, just all levels. So so I was, a- I was asking the ascended masters, God, Jesus, Mother Mary, the angels, and even I threw in the galactic brothers and sisters, not even <laughs> not even sure if they existed, but I thought, what the heck, you know, I'll just throw them in there, too. You know? so, Good on you. So I, I just thought, you know, what the heck, I might as well go for it all. So about two weeks passed by after my big prayer and nothing happened. And I was just like, OK, you know, it's another one of my unanswered prayers, you know, so I went about, you know, I just forgot about it and went about, you know, my life and then. Later that month, I went to sleep and I, when I came to, I was in a, a different consciousness and it wasn't a dream because everything was crystal clear. I mean, when you have like an ET abduction experience, everything is so clear, at least it was for me, that I knew it wasn't a dream. It, it was just the details are really sharp. The colors were more brilliant. Um, it it just was like a hyper reality. And so I knew I was in some other, other dimension or other space. So I would say this was an out of body experience, because I think physically, my body was probably still in my bed, but my consciousness was in um, this, this starship, I was actually on board an Arcturian starship. When, but when I looked at myself, like when I looked at myself when I was on board the starship, I looked like, I mean, I, mean, I had a body, you know, I, I looked like myself. I didn't look like any different than how I normally look. Uh, so I was, I was looking around and I said, wow, this looks like some sort of starship. And it didn't look metallic. So um, these higher dimensional starships aren't, aren't made of metal. You know, it's like we, you know, we always, we always see on earth, you know, sci-fi movies, you know, these these ships that, you know, they're made out of metal. Um, these ships are made of light and plasma and some other materials that I've never seen. Very organic. The ship is kind of like a sentient being in itself. The ship was guiding me towards some sort of a room. And so I just followed the ship along to this room. And the room was quite large. I, I saw um, four or five extraterrestrial beings waiting for me in the room. I knew immediately they were not Earth humans. I, I knew they were extraterrestrials. I didn't know what system they were from, at least not initially, but uh, but they looked extraterrestrial. They had the larger heads, kind of the larger eyes, and but they were they had auras that were so bright and so big that I had a hard time looking at them directly. I had to sneak glances on my periphery. And I saw that they had kind of bluish, kind of a bluish skin tone. It was hard to tell with the big bright auras, but, and they had refined features. And I knew immediately that they were not gray aliens. I mean, it was just like, I I knew immediately. And so I was formulating questions to ask them. And I was, the whole time I was thinking, do they even understand English? You know, do I, do I, you know, how do I ask them this question? And, and even before I would, finished the thought in my head, they were answering my questions in telepathy. So I, I, so immediately I had a communication. So I was real, I, I realized immediately that I was communicating telepathically with these beings, and they certainly understood English, or was able to communicate with me in a sense that was that was, was understandable to both of us. And uh, most of the questions I asked them at first were pretty basic, like, where am I? what is this? Who are you? Where are you guys from? (laughs) You know, uh, why am I here? Um, And they answered all of my questions very patiently. They told me that I I was on board an Arcturian starship, that they were Arcturians from Arcturus. And they had this holographic sphere that they had me within that was part of the room. And as they were communicating with me telepathically, they were illustrating some of their concepts in this in this holographic sphere. And so they when they, when they told me they were from Arcturus, they showed me where Arcturus was located on the star map. And they showed me what the planets were that were around the star system and the constellation it was in, which was Bodis, you know. So so this was my first you know, introduction to these these beings. And then 
Uh, they told me a little bit about their civilization and they told me the reason why I was there was because number one, they heard my prayer and they were very impressed by the sincerity of my prayer, you know, that I really was concerned for planet earth. And so they, they figured I was ready to meet with them. And then the second reason was because I'm actually an Arcturian soul that I had chosen to be on earth to do a big mission, but I had forgotten my mission. So this was like a gentle reminder from them to me that to get uh, aligned with my mission, it was now time for me to understand what was happening on earth, why we were all here on earth, and how things were going to happen moving forward. And I asked a lot of questions about the state of the planet, uh, about religion, politics, the social economics system, everything that I can think of, things that I always wondered about, I was asking them. And they were patiently answering my questions. I It felt like I was in that particular, they called it the orientation room. So I was in the orientation room for quite a while. You know, I would say, I, 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 you know, when you're in the higher realms, there is no linear time. So it's hard to quantify how long it was, but it was quite a while. And they were illustrating concepts in this holographic sphere, you know, so so sometimes, it, you know, it was so realistic that it felt like I was actually there. The one thing they told me over and over again was that everything in the 3D is an illusion and that it was part of a false matrix uh, construct in order for us to learn certain lessons and to experience duality consciousness, you know, so because um, then when we're in the higher realms, we don't, there, everything's unity consciousness is, is love consciousness. So. So being on Earth gives us the opportunity to experience something different. And it was all part of a big experiment. Um, and they said, they told me that everything was under control. They said not to worry about the Illuminati or the Dark Cabal. It's all part of this game. And it's kind of like being on a video game almost. But um was interesting because I kept saying, well, everything seems so real. You know, seems real. Like, what do you mean illusion? You know, I don't understand. And uh, the other concept that they told me about was uh, the potential for future Earth. So if we, if we as an Earth collective made the right choices, what kind of reality can we create on new Earth? And they showed me small communities with uh, homes that were integrated into the environment. Every home was growing its own food. Every home had its own free energy device. People were transporting themselves through teleporting, so there was no longer any airplanes or transportation devices. It wasn't needed anymore. And it, there was not cities as we know it. It was just small kind of rural communities. Um, and everybody seemed very happy. <laughs> it, was, it was so beautiful that I started crying. I was kept asking them, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? And they said, it's up to it's up to all of you and Earth if it's going to happen. Um, and at the time, they didn't really get mm -hmm. into my mission too much. They just told me that I came from a long line of Arcturian ambassadors, uh, historians, and scientists, um, which is interesting because I spent many years on Earth working in the scientific field. You know, so. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. And a lot of my family members, even my earthly family members are scientists, historians, you know, so kind of made sense. And they told me that even my physical genetics um, descended from Arcturus. So my, the reason why I chose to be born into my family was because my family had a certain amount of Arcturian DNA. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. And on this note, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, you mentioned starseeds. I guess there is some perhaps misconception or some confusion around the term, because some people believe that uh, starseeds are souls or are people whose souls were previously on other planets, mm -hmm. living lives on other planets. But there is also a school of thought which says that these are people who were born elsewhere on another planet mm. 
and then came here to continue their life. So which one is it or could it be both? Actually, I think it's both. Okay, because I would say the majority of star seeds that are currently here on the planet fall into that first category where they were they had a soul that that had its inception in another star system. And so they're ancient souls. They've had incarnations and off world planets until they decided to incarnate on Earth. And uh, and so they're basically Earth humans with a extraterrestrial soul. Okay. However, I do know of the, this is probably more the minority, but there are certain um, star seeds that actually were born on a different planet, and maybe were hybrids, or maybe they came in on a special mission, or they maybe they were walk-ins. You know, so. So I get that category as well. And I've done readings for both varieties, Mm -hmm. mostly of the first category. Um, But I do get a few that were either walk-ins or they're hybrids or they're they're beings that chose to be on Earth for a specific mission. Mm -hmm. And they're not really human. Okay. They might have a human avatar body, but they're not human. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have... A whole variety of them. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Would you be able to give us just a brief overview of what I call our galactic neighbors? (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I think that many of my audience may have seen on Gaia, there is a recent documentary series Mm -hmm. about our galactic neighbors or various intelligent beings, species and races living on other planets. Mm -hmm. So What I might ask you, if you could give us just a brief overview, because many people find this topic absolutely fascinating. And what I will include in this question is, are they physical beings or interdimensional or both? So how does it play out? Um, That's a great question. Uh, And there's many answers to it. So I don't want to confuse people even more, but I'll do my best to describe yeah, just just briefly. Briefly, okay. Uh, basically, we're all multidimensional beings, and so as multidimensional, you know, soul shards from source, uh, all of us choose to have multi-level experiences in different dimensions. Uh, I work with the Arcturians the most. Arcturians are able to transcend dimensions, so they're one of the few star races that. They can be fifth dimensional one day and be ninth dimensional the next. They're able to go up and down dimensions. So when they're in their fifth dimensional or sixth dimensional form, they're physical. You know, they they have a physical body. They're living a physical life. If they're in a ninth dimensional or 11th dimensional form, they become etheric and non, non-physical. And so um, I don't think Earth humans are quite at that point yet. Okay, we we still have a long ways to go in our evolution before, you know, the Arcturians, for instance, are way ahead of us in evolution. So, you know, they they have abilities that, you know, we're eventually going to be developing as Earth humans, but we're not quite there yet. And I do think there's some Pleiadian beings that also transcend dimensions. These are the higher level Pleiadian beings and other star people. You mentioned cosmic neighbors. The six races that I probably have the most knowledge of or the most interaction with are the six um, star races that had the most involvement with planet Earth. So this is where usually when I teach a course or I'm teaching a webinar, I focus on these six races. But there was also a very a lot of different other races of, of star people that also had an influence on planet Earth. So the six that I usually work with are the, is the Lyra group. So that, so that include the Vega people as well. So Lyra Vega, as I call it, Vega being the, the biggest star in the Lyra system. Uh, and I'll explain them in a minute. Um, and then The Syrian group, okay, so these are the people from Sirius, from the Canis Major constellation. And then we have the Pleiadians who are in the Taurus constellation. This is a big asterism, quite a few stars. Uh, We have Arcturians uh, from Arcturus in the Bodhis constellation. We also have Andromeda 
which I mainly focus on Andromeda constellation um, because they were the ones that were part of the Galactic Federation and uh, were were humanoid beings. Uh, and then the Orion people, you know, in the Orion constellation. So these were the six star systems that had the biggest influence on planet Earth. However, there, I, from what I understand, there was at least 22 different star people that have also had an influence on Earth, but maybe not as big of an influence, or maybe they specialized or they focused on certain areas of the planet, for instance. Um, I do get some groups that are like that, um, but maybe had a more minor role. Um, that would include Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, Tau Ceti, Venus, uh, Mars, Maldek, uh, let's see who else, uh, Procyon, uh, Cassiopeia, Antares. So we have quite a few. Okay, so there's quite a few systems. I mean, I can probably talk for hours. So, so that's some of the neighbors that, you know, I, I like to talk about and focus on and probably because I've had a connection, past connection with all of those systems. Um, uh, so when I do my, my galactic history work, I mainly focus, um, because we're here on Earth right now, I mainly focus on those star systems that had more of a direct connection with Earth civilization and Earth genetics. Um, because these are the star systems that we derive, you know, our identity from, you know, so um, as as people um, of Earth and also as, you know, light workers and star seeds, you know, so, so I focus on these ones, but sometimes then when I go into the records, I have to find out information about the Asasani or the Yael who are, you know, hybrid beings or um, some crazy being avian being from a different universe you know so so you can yeah. get you know really expanded with this stuff yes yes thank you now um many people hearing this information and skeptics in particular would ask mm -hmm. how come such detailed knowledge has been obtained by a large number mm -hmm. of people by now and was it from one source or from many and also they point out some differences in that information, which is, uh, I guess, channeled or, mm. or downloaded. So how, how would you answer those questions? You know, how, how do we know this and how, how come not just one person, but so many and, and they still may get different information? Well, that's a great question. And it's one I think about a lot, too, because I do constant research. So I'm always correlating you know, what I download from, you know, and how that compares to maybe accounts from Dolores Cannon or Alex Collier or Lisa Royale Holt or uh, Laura Eisenhower or some of the other luminaries that talk about this type of information. So um, I try to, to see, okay, does, does the, is the information I'm getting is in resonance with things that other people are talking about? And most of the time they are. I mean, most of the time, I think, uh, you know, what I what I receive seems to be in line with other information, but sometimes it isn't, you know, and I just kind of, you know, I just kind of go with the flow, you know, of it. like, okay, you know, this is what I'm picking up. There must be a reason for it. Uh, maybe other people aren't talking about it. One of the things that I think I talk about, just to give you an example that nobody else talks about, okay, and I don't know why I'm the one that downloads this information, but, and it's, e uh, and I'm not even a Pleiadian star seed. Okay. But I have a lot of connections with the Pleiades, but is the differences between the different Pleiadian uh, star systems and cultures. I mean, they all had their own specific culture and they all had their own specific uh, specialties and nobody else talks about this. And the only thing I can think of is, okay, I received this information from the Akashic Records because I've done thousands of Akashic Records readings, you know, so, um, and I also have a personal connection with, to the to the Pleiades, you know, so maybe this is some of my own soul memories that are coming through. But to answer your question about why people are getting different information, some of it is frame of reference. So mm -hmm. everybody 
is a human, you know, they're okay. receiving, they're channeling this information, they're downloading it, but, but they're, ta- they're interpreting it through their own frame of reference. So maybe the way I describe something might, and we might be seeing the same thing, but the way I describe it might be different than the way you would describe it because of our frame of reference. Um, so that's part of the issue. And, and we're all 3D humans and our brains are kind of limited, you know, so we can only yeah. <laughs> work with what we have, you know. Yes, absolutely. And this, in thank you. And this, in fact, makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's what I tend to think. Mm-hmm that we have all different filters uh, through which uh, the, we interpret uh, the information that is coming through. So that's why it does make a lot of sense. Now, before we talk about the Akashic Records, which is a big topic in mm-hmm. itself. Oh, yeah. We talk for hours on that one, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And obviously you have courses and, and whatnot, and yeah. we'll talk about those as yeah. well in a bit. What I would like to ask you at this point is, Again, it's one of those curiosity questions that not many people who receive those downloads talk Mm. about or write about. Do we know anything about other beings' spirituality? Mm -hmm. Do they have religion systems similar to ours or just a blanket spirituality? Do they believe in God? And is their spiritual concept of the creation similar to ours? Is there anything any spiritual information coming through about this? Oh yeah, that's that's real. You're asking really awesome questions. So I do my I, best. <laughs> this is stuff I talk. I always think about too. But actually, when I was on, yeah, when I was on board the Arcturian starship, that was actually one of the questions I asked. Is I asked them, "Do you guys have religion? What's your religion?" And the, the Arcturians were laughing at me. I mean, in a kindly way, but they were laughing at me because they they told me that religion as far as we know it here on earth is a man-made construct and it was created to keep people controlled or to, to promote a certain narrative or a certain agenda. Okay. Um, And what they told me is they don't need to have religion because they have a direct connection with source. Uh, These are highly spiritual beings. You know, they, they revere um, their, their, their connection with, with source. and they did, I think, for my benefit, called Source God, okay, because at that point, I was still Roman Catholic, you know, trying to figure out what they were telling me. But but they said, oh, no, we have a direct, we don't need um, religion. And I think that's even true with other star races. So it's not just the Arcturians that believe this, but any benevolent, advanced race of beings um, don't really have a religious system. Um, they do for follow universal law. They follow certain spiritual concepts that are universal to our universe. Um, but but they're, they're, they don't have a religion in the sense of, oh, they believe a certain thing or, you know, or you have to believe these certain stories because that's the narrative. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And another common question that comes up around this topic, and I hear it all the time, so Mm -hmm. I would be really curious to hear your view. And there is a particular focus that I would like to bring in. Why after thousands of years, and there are, say, documented thousands of years, is the ET contact with us still covered rather than overt? And as a lead, I'd like to make this point. In terms of our engagement with intelligent beings from other planets, or the lack of thereof, I'd like to quote Dr. Dean Radin, who wrote this amazing book, Real Magic, that I highly, highly recommend. But Mm -hmm. there was one particular part of this book that really caught my attention, and I read it only recently, in which he says, if ETs are watching, they may well have decided that as a species, We are still basically infants, spending most of our time sleeping, pooping, and crying. What other than our planet-sized ego makes us think that the conscious universe of galactic minds would be interested in engaging with infants? (laughs) 
And I particularly love this metaphoric sleeping, pooping, and crying, <laughs> which of course can translate into our immature humanistic behavior, like infants, yeah, totally. comparing to to highly evolved civilizations. And and so I, w- I was laughing when I was reading <laughs> when I was reading this passage because it it rings so true on on many levels. Could you speak to this for a moment? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. That's uh, that's something that. I've often thought about as well. I mean, I, uh, these are these are things that I pretty much base some of the premise of my work on. But um, so, as far as why aren't extraterrestrials engaging with planet Earth? Um, they used to in in be- the beginning of Earth's history. You know, so uh, back when we when there was Atlantis and Lemuria and Egypt, you know, there was extraterrestrial beings visiting earth and that they were acting as our teachers because at that point, earth humans were more open to it. Okay. Um, and they were living a uh, higher consciousness level lives, but then we fell into uh, the control of the Roman, the, the Roman empire. And then after that, after the Roman empire fell, you know, uh, the the earth went into the dark ages, you know, so we went way backwards in our evolution, you know, during the middle ages. And we've been, you know, trying to evolve from that ever since. But, um, but compared to other civilizations out there in the galaxy and out there in the universe, earth is really primitive. Okay, we're super primitive. I mean, it's, there is no question about it. I mean, uh, we are way behind technologically, spiritually, mentally, yeah. uh, emotionally compared to other sentient star beings. So they know if they visit Earth, Earth people are going to immediately want to attack them. Okay, first of all, um, Earth people are not going to accept them. Uh, and so they don't they don't feel like we're quite at the at the right evolutionary level yet to have interactions with with extraterrestrial beings. So I do agree with um, that that wonderful person that made that quote, that we're, we're just not ready for it, okay? Um, so right now we're going through this evolutionary process of awakening. So more and more people are awakening, more and more people are asking yeah. questions, and more and more people are realizing that we're not alone in the universe. I don't know who came up with the idea that uh, Earth humans were the only intelligent species and the freaking galaxy are you freaking kidding me i mean yeah i mean that just is it's ludicrous to think okay there's billions of stars out there billions of planets and we're the only ones i mean what kind of arrogance does that take to think yeah you know but but i think as far as uh extraterrestrial contact now we did have more contact with extraterrestrials in um in the beginning of earth's history you know so uh there's many accounts of of people interacting with what they called the gods, you know, uh, Sumerian culture was one of them, Egyptian culture, uh, you know, Atlanteans, and so forth and so on. But I think um, once humanity turned away from that level of spirituality, the extraterrestrials decided to take a step back, you know, so they're, they're kind of observing our planet. So they're observing it, kind of seeing how we're, we're evolving. But because of the law of non-interference, this is a universal law of non-interference, they can't interfere with our development. Uh, So they have to take a step back and allow Earth humans to get to a point of evolution where they can, again, start visiting us again, Mm. which I think is going to happen fairly soon. Okay, (laughs) Um, I think it's going to happen probably within the next decade. That's That's my soon. Okay. um, Okay. Yeah, yeah, some people yeah. say, but maybe in, a, in the next hundred years. But uh, I mean, I would love. This is one of my, um, how should I put it? Not on my bucket list, but one of my dreams or desires is that I would love this to happen in my lifetime. So before I exit this plane, I really would love to witness and be part yeah, me of. Too. Disclosure, you know, as as many people call it, yeah. more broadly. I think it's going to happen in 2032. 2032? That's, that's okay. the date what I keep seeing. 2032. So okay. so about a decade from now. Maybe, it's, maybe it'll be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter compared to how quickly we evolve. But 
I think at that point, when we when we have extraterrestrial contact and everybody on the planet knows about it, it's no longer hidden. Okay, it's no. And I'm going to get to that that question that you asked too. Why has it been hidden all these years? But uh, when it's no longer hidden, Earth will have no choice but to evolve at a at a evolutionary rate just beyond anything we've ever seen in this universe. Um, there's no going back at that point. Now, there are certain entities and certain um, groups here on Earth that do not want to see this yes. happen. Uh, the reason why extraterrestrial contact has been hidden from the general public is not because Earth humans can't handle it. It's because they don't want us to start asking questions and start realizing our galactic heritage. They want to keep us small. I and mean, I'm talking about the dark cabal, the Illuminati, or whatever you want to call them, you know, the, the powers to be that think they're, you know, they have control over everything. But but they want to keep us thinking that we're separate from source, that we're just these insignificant little beings living our own little insignificant lives. Because once yeah. we start realizing our galactic heritage and our galactic lineage, we're going to become so empowered that we're not going to accept um, the standards of living that have been bestowed upon us at this time. We're going to start fighting back and saying, hey, what's what the heck is this? You know, um, so it's, it's a control method, basically. Um, you know, they that's why our history is a lot of our history is all lies. You know, they've hidden a lot of our history. They've hidden a lot of our galactic um heritage. Um, and so I consider it my own personal mission, <laughs> my own personal mission to remind everybody that we're part of the greater galactic family, and that we have a beautiful star families out there that are rooting for us and uh, uh, wanting us to become to to rejoin that family in the near future. So I consider it my personal mission to share this information. And I appreciate you having me here in order to do that. Thank you. Yes. And good on you, because we do need people like you uh, spreading this information. Mm -hmm. Now, there was another curious question, if you like. Uh, you mentioned uh, the universal law of non-interference. Mm -hmm. And I think most people engage with this topic, uh, understand what it means. But the curious question related to this is, some people claim that the Earth and all governments are actually controlled by ETs. Mm -hmm. So are we a sovereign species or is someone else pulling the strings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, my understanding from the Akashic Records is uh, we were meant to be a sovereign race of beings, but there were negative factions that came in from Orion and Draco and other malevolent systems, even Zeta Reticuli, that had their own agendas or their own desires to control planet earth for you know whatever their reasons were and uh have since been controlling the planet since the times of atlantis okay so this has been kind of ongoing for thousands and thousands of years uh, now the part of the whole process of the ascension you know that the you know the ascension from the third dimension to the fifth dimension is is all of us as human beings and uh, you know, that are all uh, connected to these star races, um, uh, that all of us will eventually claim self-sovereignty and claim, you know, our our true galactic heritage, you know. So, um, so these malevolent beings are actually directly violating the universal law of non-interference. Can they do this? And they're going to pay the price for it. Okay, oh, they yeah. are going to. Yeah, they're going to pay the price for it. Okay. They've gotten away with it. I mean, they've gotten away with it for a long time, but I don't know if they actually gotten away with it. I think um, their karma eventually catches up with them. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, and I think that's happening now, even behind the scenes. I think there's a lot of shifts and changes that are occurring in our world governments that people don't know about. My dear husband and partner, uh, Terry, loves to follow a lot of this information. This is more the disclosure, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theory type type of information, but uh, which yeah. I'm not a big mm -hmm. follower of, but I'm aware of it because of him. But there, there are currently uh, 
I would say the white hats or, or, you know, the benevolent people on earth who are trying to work with benevolent star races in order to bring peace and unity to this, to this system. Um, and one of the first things that's going to be taken down is the monetary system. That's going to change. And the governments are going to, going to be dismantled. And I, I believe it's currently happening as we speak. It's just happening behind the scenes because if they were overt with it, the dark forces would take them down. You know, so they have to kind of do it um, kind of in the shadows right now. But uh, yeah, the dark forces would try to stop them. So um, so yeah, so there's kind of this this war between light and dark that's currently happening. Um, and we all we've all chosen to be a part of this. So some of us are light workers. Some of us are part of the dark. You know, so so we're all part, part playing a part in this uh, in this struggle. But um, eventually, the light will prevail. It always does. So yeah. So we will see the. Uh, I mean, I I truly believe that we will see the ascension to the fifth dimension in this lifetime. You know, while we're still alive. Okay. Um, I want to be here to see it. Okay. I didn't, I didn't sign up for this just to be told that, Oh, it's going to happen in another 500 years. And it's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. Good. It's got to happen soon. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're going to make it happen. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm with you on this. Yeah, as I said, I I also want to want to witness and be part of it in this lifetime because oh, totally. Oh, it's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. just uh, fascinating, fascinating times. Well, Debbie, before we move on to Akashic Records, I just would like to share something with you. On your website, there are images, obviously created by an artist, depicting Lemuria and Atlantis, and I have to tell you. I absolutely love them, but more than just because they are so beautiful. When I look at them, I sense, I have this strange feeling of nostalgia, almost like I know this place. Mm -hmm. I want to be there. And it is a very similar feeling to, to how I felt when I was watching the movie Avatar, if you've seen this. There are those mm -hmm. undercurrents of some information that is uh, that is being projected, as it was in the movie, obviously. Mm -hmm. And from those images, uh, and I, I forgot the name of the artist who created them, but they are not only absolutely beautiful, but where do you know whether those images were in any way channeled? Because they are just so. It's like, you know, which is a silly thing to say. It's as if I was actually watching a photo of Lemuria or a photo of Atlantis. It just mm -hmm. rings so close to my heart. Was this information channeled? Did it come? Did you give the artist some feedback or some instructions or did they follow just their own intuition? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for uh, sharing that. Um, that was actually my intent in creating these images was, and I didn't create them myself. I had an artist obviously help me, but I wanted to make it so realistic that people would look at these images and they, it would trigger soul memories or would trigger some sense of remembrance or some sense of, like you said, nostalgia. That was my whole intent with, with that section of my, my website is the galactic history section. But, uh, but actually with the artist. I basically told them my perception of these beings, they kind of ran with it. Okay. So I gave them some creative license, but the particular artists that have worked on um, the imagery for my website, they, a lot of it was channeled, I think not only through me, but also for them as well, you know, so they were also doing their own channeling. And I have to say, when I saw the images, that when I first saw them, I said, oh, my God, this is exactly how I imagined these beings. It's exactly how I, I mean, I was, I was in tears actually looking at some of these images because it, it's how I see them when I connect with the Akashic Records. And that was what I wanted to create on my website. 
So thank you so much for that feedback because um, it sounds like what uh, my, what my intention was is actually yes. being manifested. So yeah, absolutely. And for me, in fact, it wasn't so much the images of the beings of the various races, but uh, but there are two, I believe, two or more, but especially two main images depicting Lemuria and Atlantis. Yeah, we we created that too. And yeah. those are, they so deeply resonate with me at some very, very mm -hmm. deep level that it actually brought tears to my eyes. So yeah, mission accomplished, Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm currently <laughs> writing a book and we plan to insert a lot of those images in my, it's going to be a book on galactic history. So, oh, so everybody lovely. will have access to this information. That's my, my goal, but uh, beautiful. Yeah. But we're going to insert, we're going to uh, include a lot of these images because I want people to read the book and really be able to imagine what it was like living in these civilizations, whether they be Lemuria or Pleiades or Arcturus or anywhere. But, um, but thank you. for that. Yeah. I, I was yeah. almost taken there. I was, I was almost like entering that that image. It was a very special experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, so you had some questions about the Akashic records. So I'll let you do that. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about the Akashic records. So for those uh, people who may not mm -hmm. be familiar or just a little mm -hmm. familiar, could you explain to us what are the Akashic records? How do you get or gain access to them and on a continuous basis? So with your readings, uh, what is the process, how it, this happens? And if you could include in your response the ethics of accessing personal information by someone else. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'll take it in parts. So sure. um, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. try to answer that yeah. in, in, in sections. But um, first of all, the Akashic records are pretty much like the um, the energetic records of every single event, every single emotion, every single thing that happens in our universe. So um, it doesn't matter if you're a fly or if you're a human, you're going to have Akashic records about you. Okay. It's just, and all of us contribute to the Akashic records. So um, it's not like it's just higher dimensional beings that are writing the records, all of us as a collective are contributing information to the record. So this is kind of like a super co computer. And some people imagine the Akashic records as being like a library or, um, or some sort of physical place. I, I don't quite see it like that. I, when I go into the records, it's almost like I'm pulling like an energetic crystal that contains that person's story. And then I open up the crystal in a movie plates, you know, so that's, that's how I, I, I access the records. And then the Akasha guides are around me, you know, to answer questions. So, you know, if I have a question about something, um, they're usually really helpful. I mean, Akasha guides are really super helpful. So, uh, so I rely on the guides a lot, actually, when I, when I go into somebody's records, but, um, but it's mainly, uh, it's, and, and it's actually accessible by everybody. So a lot of people think that, oh, um, I'm just, um, uh, you have to be special or you have to have like a special password or a special, <laughs> you know, a special ability to access the records. Uh, maybe that was true in the past, you know, so maybe only a few people in our past history had access to the records. But nowadays, because the consciousness has expanded so much, especially in the last few decades, everybody has access to the records and everybody has access now to the galactic Akashic records. So we, we don't only have to limit ourselves to information from planet Earth, but also we can access information from any system within the universe. Um, so, uh, so all of us have access to it. But like any other skill, um, I do have to say that it does require a certain amount of practice um, because a lot of us have been trained not to work with our intuition. Our, our third eyes are shut down. We don't, we're, we're very rusty as far as our psychic abilities. So it's a, it's a good idea usually to work on opening your third eye or work on your clair, clair gifts, as I call them, you know, your clair audience, clairvoyance you know, clairsentience gifts. Um, 
and practice with that and uh, practice going into the records. And you'll download the information fairly quickly. Sometimes what happens with people that are new, that are just learning how to access the records, is they get like a big dump of information and they get overwhelmed. Uh, it's either that or they're having a hard time even accessing you know, that higher realm. Uh, and this is all information that I'm, I'm going to be teaching in my upcoming course, which is a uh, galactic Akashic records reading course, um, or I call it the GAR course, but uh, it's an eight week course. Uh, my focus is on, on how to access the galactic records, not just the earth records. So a big section of the course is based on galactic history, because I believe if you don't know what you're looking at in the records, you're not going to understand what you're seeing. Um, so I give a lot of information about different star races and their history and things like that. Uh, so people have a premise on what to jump off from when they're when they're accessing these records. Uh, as far as your question about you had a, this, the, the last part the of ethics. your question. Can you remind me? What that, the yeah, ethics. The ethics. Yeah. Yeah. The ethics. Um, there is a great responsibility as far as accessing Akashic records. Um, so you always want to do it for the highest good. So um, when I teach my course, part of the course actually contains um, the ethics and responsibilities. of. So I just have like a list of, um, of ethics and responsibilities that you want to incorporate when you're accessing the Akashic records. Uh, so one of those is, of course, keeping your information confidential. You know, that, that's without saying, you know, so you're not going to access somebody's records and share it with everybody. With that being said, I do have a YouTube channel. And some, and a lot of times on that channel, I do uh, share um, people's readings, but it's with their express permission before I do that. Okay. Um, uh, other ethics is you never want to tell somebody when they're going to die or how they're going to die. That's just not useful information. Um, or if they have a terminal illness, I mean, sometimes you will see that information in the records, but um, if you have to share something that's negative with somebody, you always want to check with their guides and with the Akashic guides to ensure that is this information going to re-traumatize the person or is it going to be of benefit to them? And usually the Akashic guides and or and or their guides will let you know. Um, they're usually pretty clear about that. Um, uh, cause a lot of times you'll see very negative information. And, you know, a lot of times you're thinking, gosh, I'm gonna tell this person, <laughs> you know, the blow by blow details of what happened to them, you know, during this horror or during this experience, you know, this traumatic experience they went through. Or, or even if it's a future event, you know, do I want to tell them this, you know, so, so there is a lot of ethics involved. Another thing is you don't want to use the records to gain, get dirt on somebody. Like, let's say if you went through a bad breakup, and you're angry at your ex, and you're using the records to get information about your ex partner in order to make their lives miserable. You don't want to do that either. Okay. That's just without saying, but uh, you always, but it's okay to access the records about um, family members as long as you're wanting, you have a sincere desire to use it for the highest good. For so, for instance, you can go into the records and say, you know, hey, I want information on my ex partner because I want to learn kind of the dynamics of our relationship and how I can heal from it. Okay. Um, which brings in the three levels of healing. So the three levels of, of healing are uh, basically to, to see what's happening, okay? So first of all, see what's happening currently, see what's the premise of what's happening currently, and what's the, what, what, could, what are the potential outcomes that could come from this situation that somebody's dealing with? And uh, we also teach that in the course as well. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, I believe it's a groundbreaking course. Um, so right now, uh, the course is, um, course registration is closed. Um, we started the course, but we will be offering this, this particular course on a yearly basis. So even if you weren't able to get in this time, we'll definitely have it available next year. So I hope you can join us then.
Now, I'd like to go back to seeing what you might describe as negative information in the person's Akashic records. When you do, whether it's about past, present, or future on our linear timeline, and you are not sure whether to convey this to, to the client, what do you do? Do you seek help from the guides, or how do you discern whether to say this to the client or not? Because some people who perhaps are more vulnerable may not benefit from this information. But then there are others who say like, yeah, no, give, it, give it all to me. I want, I want to know everything, every, you know, it doesn't matter how bad it is. I want to know. So how do you discern whether to say something of this nature or not? That's a great question. And it's something that we actually teach in the course as well. When I work with clients, sometimes I use my own, uh, I guess, uh, intuitive guidance, you know, so, so intuitively, I, I know whether or not this client can handle this, this, this information. The other thing I use is sometimes I will rely on their guides, like, hey, is, are they ready to listen to, to hear this information or not? And sometimes their guys will give the green light. They say, yeah, just go for it. You know, so I'm like, okay, you know, so I'm going to go ahead and tell them. Um, uh, but sometimes I, I won't tell them. Um, to give you just a really brief example, um, I was doing a reading once for a family member of mine, not my immediate family, but just somebody in my extended family. And I saw in the records that she was a sex slave in... Um, during the Lyran Wars, you know, that uh, she was captured by reptilians. And it was very graphic what I saw. It was just, you know, and I, I know my, my family member, she's very sensitive. And I thought, geez, if I tell her this information, she's going to freak out and it's not going to really serve her any good. So I checked with her guides and I said, should I tell her this? And they were saying, no, no, don't tell her. And I was like, okay, that kind of confirms what I was thinking. So I didn't tell her um, during her reading. Now I have other clients who will say, I want to know everything about my childhood. Just tell me everything. I mean, I, I don't remember anything. So just tell me what happened. And I say, okay, if, if I go into your records and I see child sexual abuse, do you want me to tell you? And they'll tell me yes. And I say, okay. And then I'll go into the records. And sure enough, more times out than not, there'll be childhood sexual abuse. Okay. So, um, but they, but they give me permission to tell them. So I go ahead and tell them. Okay. Um, so there's very nuanced, different nuances of this situation, but I think a lot of it is our own intuitive and professional I guess, guidance, you know, of what we think would be the pro appropriate thing to do. And if, if in and doubt, you know, you can always rely on the guides as well. Mm, thank you. Yes, this makes a lot of sense. And that's what I was thinking too. And that's what I think everyone would expect, high professional standards and this really fine level of discernment of the impact of the information on, on the mm -hmm. particular person. So thank you for outlining that. What is the Galactic Federation? That's a question I get a lot. <laughs> I get a, that question a lot. We all want Some to people know. think they're bad. <laughs> Some people think they're good. I don't know. I, I do think they're a good entity. Yeah, that's my belief anyway. I think there's factions that pretend to be the Galactic Federation that aren't really the Galactic Federation, but but for the most part, they are uh, an actual alliance. But basically what they are, they are an alliance of benevolent beings that have banded together to promote peace and unity throughout the galaxy. So um, they're trying to prevent another Lyra catastrophe from happening again. So um, and they're trying to maintain, you know, sovereignty, self-sovereignty and uh, um, free will and freedom throughout throughout our universe. Uh, so there are, my understanding is hundreds of thousands of races that are part of the Galactic Federation, um, all with very similar goals. Um, you know, so a lot of the benevolent groups that we, cur we currently work with a lot here on this planet, like such as the Pleiadians, the Arcturians, the Andromedans, the Syrians, they're members of the Galactic Federation. And so the Galactic Federation will oftentimes will, will go and assist other star systems in achieving 
that level of self-sovereignty so that they, they can continue their own evolution. They did this in Orion because Orion, I always kind of compare Orion to Star Wars, like you were mentioning Avatar before, which to me, Avatar reminds me of Lyra and Vega. So, so a lot of us really loved uh, loved Avatar. We cried during the movie because it reminded us of Lyra. A lot of us had incarnations in Lyra. So a lot of us connected with that movie for that reason. And a lot of us connect with Star Wars because it reminds us of lifetimes in Orion when there was a lot of duality consciousness and conflicts. Um, so the Galactic Federation was coming in in Orion to assist with helping the Orion people achieve unity consciousness. Okay. Um, they wanted them to be able to choose their own destiny rather to be overtaken by some sort of an empire. Okay. Um, and so that was the whole purpose. And they're, they're currently here on earth right now doing the same thing. Now we have to keep in mind, there is that universal law of non-interference, you know, so they can only do so much, but, if we directly ask them for help, they will help us, okay? Um, so that's the key right there. That's the reason why you see sometimes the Galactic Federation is cleaning up our oceans or erasing the chemtrails or, you know, or dismantling some of the nuclear weapons, you know, because somebody out there had asked them for assistance and um, they, they can help us at that point. Yes, thank you. Thank you for saying this, because I just feel that this is the key to my earlier question about this potential conflict between the universal law of non-interference and help and assistance or interference mm -hmm. of some sort. And I think what you just said just then is the key, which is if we ask specifically for mm -hmm. help, they can, if you like, breach the boundaries of that law of non-interference because we've asked mm -hmm. them for help and assist us in we some pretty way. pretty much have given them, you know, the yeah. carte blanche, you yeah. know, invitation to help us. Yeah. That was why yeah. I think I had the contact with the Arcturians because they weren't going to interfere with my free will, but I was actively asking for assistance for the planet, you know, so that mm -hmm. gave the opening for them to contact me, you know, so asking yeah. specifically galactic brothers and sisters you know so that gave yeah. the invitation to assist me and you know um and uh, realign me with my mission so i'm very thankful for that beautiful yes thank you so much for for pointing this out now debbie what is the most important message from our galactic neighbors for the human race at this point in time that you keep hearing? So the most important message I'm getting right now, um, I would say this is kind of universal across all of us, is that we have to clear our, our karmic patterns, our karmic issues. Uh, we cannot enter the fifth dimension with unhealed karmic issues from past lives or from this lifetime or with, with soul contracts. So a lot of my clients um, opt to, to do clearing work either with me or with other people because uh, they're wanting to keep their auric field and, you know, their, their soul evolution very clear so that we can all um, achieve love consciousness. Uh, we will not be able to achieve the fifth dimension without stepping into that full level love consciousness. Uh, because the fifth dimension is a telepathic reality. And so if we're having negative thoughts or if we're dealing with negative, you know, karmic and emotional baggage, we're going to be infecting everybody with these negative thoughts if we're all telepathic and all con connected. So, so we have to do this clearing work and it's very difficult. I mean, it's difficult for people to do shadow work or to do soul retrieval work or try to do the ancestral, you know, heal, healing, you know, it, it gets, it's very, very difficult. It's painful, but it's almost like a necessary process. Um, it's necessary for us to heal ourselves before we can turn around and assist others in healing themselves, you know, so that's also part of the process. Uh, so I'm seeing this evolution of us clearing ourselves 
And in, in addition to that, we're clearing our entire family ancestral karma. So as star seeds, we've taken on soul contracts with earth families because we're not originally from earth. Okay. So in order for us to incarnate on earth, we have to negotiate with these earth families. Like, Hey, if I incarnate in your family, I'll heal your entire ancestral karma. And so a lot of earth families were like, Oh yeah, I want to star seed because they'll clear our karma. Okay. Um, and so we're, we're setting the pathway, not only for us to ascend, but also for our families to ascend. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't, don't, they don't have to do their own work, but it just makes it easier for them. Um, so, uh, so we take on these contracts to clear the ancestral karma. So for that reason, a lot of star seeds and light workers go through very difficult childhoods, you know, where they just feel like, gosh, you know, everything feels so heavy and I don't know why I'm dealing with this. It's one thing after another, but we're doing it in order. It's like we're accelerating that that clearing of the ancestral karma by doing that. And then from there, we're able to say, okay, I not only cleared my own karma, but I cleared the karma of my, my entire uh, earth family line. And so this is paving the way for ascension. Okay. Um, and then from there, um, the next step is to raise vibration. Okay. We have to keep our vibrations high, no matter what, if that means not watching TV, if that means you know, changing your diet or changing your lifestyle or hanging around different types of people. That's what we need to do in order to keep our vibrations high because our, our galactic brothers and sisters can only meet us halfway. So if we're low vibrational, they're not going to go all the way down. <laughs> okay. They, they want to meet us kind of halfway, maybe at least in the fourth dimensional zone, you know, but they're not going to go all the way down to the third dimension. So so raising vibration would be the the second step. And then the third step will be stepping into that true love consciousness, you know, letting letting go of all of our earthly attachments, you know, uh, becoming uh, connected with each other, you know, being becoming part of community, being of service to others. That's what's going to help us reach the fifth dimension. And we're all currently uh, creating this as a collective, but also even individual. So I have a lot of clients and myself included that we're able to create fifth dimensional lifestyles, even though technically we still live in the third dimension, but, but really we're not. We're in this alternate dimension. And what people are going to start seeing as they're doing this work is that there's going to be certain shifts and changes in their lives or maybe you know, they won't work their old job anymore, or they'll, they'll create this new lifestyle, or they'll move someplace, or they'll change partners, or family members will fall away, and their friends will fall away, and they'll gain new friends that are more in alignment with this new frequency. And uh, they'll find that their lives will become like things that they probably only dreamed of even a few years ago, you know, so and we all have the power of manifestation to create this fifth dimensional reality. That's what's going to help bring the entire planet to that state. Uh, uh, the other thing that we also need to do is to um, assist others in awakening. So not that we need to be on a soapbox, you know, banging on their doors, you know, saying, hey, you need to wake up, but, but doing it just in our own gentle way, you know, um, even if we're just hanging around them, just sharing our higher frequency with them, that helps activate something within them. So, so I think we have a lot of work left to do, but we're doing a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's still a lot of work, but we're doing it and we're doing it very quickly in the grand scheme of things, you know? So I know it seems like everything's so slow on the third dimension. It's like, oh my God, it takes so long for anything to happen, you know, but things are actually time speeding up more and more these days. Thank yeah. you for allowing me to share that because uh, that's, that's also, um, I think one of my mantras is I'm going to ascend and I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Yes, this is a very important message and it makes so much sense. And there's a lot, there of, work a lot of work to do. There is a lot of work to do. Um, I, I was, I, I think we're kind of beyond the beginning phase of it. So I, I, I really believe that we're really underway right now, but 
we just have so many unawakened humans, you know, so it's like, yeah, it's like, please wake up. Like we, wake you know, up, we we're doing this for your good. <laughs> you know, it's not like, we're, you know, trying to sign you up in a cult or anything like that. It's just that um, it's just for the greater good of all, you know, that, yeah. uh, you know, people awaken to what's really happening on the planet and how they can transcend it. Absolutely. Well, Debbie, we could be talking for another few hours, but time is catching up with us. So you've already touched upon some of your courses and, and books and work. So could you now just give us a, a bit of an overview of your courses, programs, uh, webinars, offerings, books? And once again, I will include all the links in the show notes, but just to give us a, a sense of how people can connect with you to engage with your work and what are your offerings? Oh. Uh, great. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, so probably the easiest way to get a hold of me would be through my website, which is debbiesolaris.com. So D-E-B-B-I-E-S-O-L-A-R-I-S, just like my name. So uh, if you're interested in galactic history, I do have a big section that's accessible for free for anybody that goes on my website, where you see a lot of beautiful imagery, as um, Anna mentioned, and uh a lot of inf- a lot of content, a lot of information about different star races. Uh, and we're going to be adding more and more star races as go- time goes on. But uh, um, we also talk about um, Earth, Earth civilizations as well in one of the sections. But uh, um, I also uh, offer a course called the Galactic Akashic Reading Course. Um, uh, so that course uh, is offered yearly. Um, so probably by the time this is aired, uh, we will have closed the registration for this year, but uh, but it, it'll be available next year. So if you're interested, just reach out to us and we'll put you on a, a waiting list of sorts, you know, so we'll contact you when it happens again. Uh, I also w- offer quarterly webinars, very inexpensive, you know, you know, you pay 40, 50 bot dollars and we'll give you two hours of really um, informative information on different topics that pertains to star seeds and star seed life and trying to navigate our way in this planet and, you know, everything else. So we do have some of these videos currently available for purchase in on Kajabi. So if you go on the training section of my website, you'll be able to access um at, you know, these, these, the prior trainings and webinars that we offered. Um, and we're going to be offering another one in June. So uh, stay tuned for that. That one will be on anti-aging, which I think is all an interest in a lot of us. A lot of us are interested in anti-aging. So, so that should be a good one. Uh, um, I, I'm still doing personal readings, but to be quite honest, um, I have a waiting list that's thousands of people long so when I'll be able to take on and I have a very long waiting list so I don't know when I'll be able to take on new clients but if you're interested just reach out and um, either myself or my assistant will help you and uh, lastly um, you can find me on YouTube Um, I have a YouTube channel I have an Instagram channel and I'm on Facebook I I don't do the TikTok sorry guys I don't I'm not into the TikTok but um, but I do all all the other stuff so if you just want to follow me see what I'm up to those would be great channels to do that as well and that's pretty much me in a nutshell so thank you and oh yeah, just one more thing. If you have if you have a Gaia subscription, you could, I've been on several interviews. I've, I'm on Deep Space. I'm on Open Minds. I'm also on uh, Beyond Belief with George Norrie. So if you're interested in hearing uh, additional information and you have a Gaia subscription, just uh, check out my name and you'll see all kinds of interviews. So that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks. Well, Debbie, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. And as I said, time has caught up with us. But uh, I I do hope that people who may not be familiar with this topic or just a little familiar have gained a better understanding of our galactic neighbors. And if they wish to do so, they can contact you and go to your website and get all other information. There is so much that they can access and learn more about it. And sign up on your courses and whatnot. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Is there any final message 
that you would like to leave our audience with before we close? Um, sure. Uh, and let me check in with my guides and see what comes through. I would say uh, keep open to the possibility that uh, you are an ancient soul, that you're here on a special mission. And, you know, if you're interested in exploring that, just go out there and, you know, read all the, inf there's many different wonderful teachers and, and healers out there. Unfortunately, like I said, mentioned before, I can't take on new clients at, at the moment. That might change in the future, but uh uh, but until then, uh, you know, stay open to the possibility of you also being a star seed and being here on a great mission. And uh, I just want to wish everybody a lot of blessings on their journey because uh, we're, we're, we're reaching into a very exciting time. So the earth is going to change dramatically and we're all privileged to be a part of it. Um, and I'm privileged to be here with all of you right now. So thank you. Many blessings to you. Thank and you so much, Debbie. And it's been such a pleasure to have you on Quantum Living. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And all the best. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.